Welcome to Sherlock Mondays, everyone. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we're going on a biblio venture through the stories of Sherlock Holmes. This is episode 23, The Adventure of the Rygate Squire, and joining me in just a moment is Mary Alcaro. Hi, Mary. Hey, Ed. How are you? I am good, Mary. You know, including tonight, there are just eight shows left. So I can't believe it. I feel like we just started this. We did, uh, you know, several months ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Feels probably longer for you since you have come up with stuff ago. every yeah. week. <laughs> well, we have eight more shows of Sherlock Mondays to deduce, decipher, dissect Arthur Conan Doyle's stories about the world's first consulting detective, Sherlock Holmes, and his able assistant, Dr. John Watson, in a kind of conversational annotation. As you're watching right now, I ask you to please like these videos, to subscribe to this channel. If you're watching live, have fun in the live chat. Sherlock Mondays is also an audio podcast, so hello to all of our podcast listeners. Thanks for tuning in. And I ask everyone if you would please consider making a donation to the Rosenbach. Uh, if you've already donated or joined as a member, thank you so much. That's really how we get to do this show for free because of your support for the Rosenbach. So if you have not already donated or become a member, I invite you to do so. Or if you could make a further donation, I invite you to do so as well. It really does make a big difference. Any amount, any amount helps. But Mary, before we start talking tonight, I can ask you, what are we drinking? We are drinking a rest cure because I love a pun. I love um, it. A R in parentheses, rest. Or I see what you did there. Well, uh -huh, uh -huh. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm going to be a great dad someday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So this is not hard to make, um, and I think it's got a nice balance to it. This is about two ounces of sherry, uh, about a half. I had trouble getting good sherry at uh, the, the local PA fine wines and spirits store. Um, they only had junk. and uh, so But I use dry sack is what I use. The sack is a, is a combination of sherries, yes. and it's a little bit small. It's it's good. So absolutely balance out in here with the with the triple sack. See, it's not it's not fine wines. It's it's fine wines. And I could be a little Falstaff like with my <laughs> set. So well, every episode features a Sherlock tale designed by our good friend and co-host Mary El Caro. You can find the recipes in the YouTube description for each episode. And I also send out the recipe via email every week for those of you who are registered for the show. You can register at the Sherlock Mondays homepage on rosenback.org. Well, Mary, it has been too long because you missed an episode. So we're I bringing did. you back. So we're very happy to come for you, have you back. And I think when you were gone, what happened was we went, We now have a poet laureate. Uh, I don't think you were on a show where we had this, did you? I was not. One of our viewers, Claire Danes, uh, who watches from Canterbury, New Zealand, uh, has been posting poems for the stories in the YouTube comments. So it's after every episode runs, then we get the... And then she went back and started putting poems in for the earlier episodes. Gosh, were... what a talent. So, um, and they're all fun. They're all... Some of them are parodies. Like, some of them were limericks. Um, last week's was a total tongue twister that I managed to deliver. I was shocked. Um but the Musgrave ritual from uh, the new one from Claire goes, twinkle, twinkle, royal hat. How I wonder where you're at. Down below in cellar room, leading Butler to his doom. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll drink to that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Cheers, Claire. And Claire has a book uh, also featuring her verse. It's available from MX Publishing. MX creates a lot of great Sherlockian books. This one is called The Hunting of the Narc, Sherlock Holmes Through the Looking Glass. And the copy on it says, imagine a world where the logic of Sherlock Holmes meets the nonsense of Wonderland. The Hunting of the Narc combines the best of Lewis Carroll and Arthur Conan Doyle's adventures into a madcap collection of verse, including the novella-length case, The Adventure of the Twinkling Hat. Um that sounds like a lot of fun and also and especially with the Rosenbach, we, we have this massive great 
Lewis Carroll collection too. So maybe, you know, as if, if that happens someday in the future for a show like this, maybe we get to bring in some more of Claire Danes's poems. But that book, uh, The Hunting of the Narc, is also illustrated by another of our viewers, Madeline Quinones, who you know well, I think, as a as a as a wonderful Sherlockian. So even more reason to get that. And we've put the link for that book in our in our chat. And somebody's already asking, what's the Rygate Squire poem? Well, that'll be in the comments when the show is over. So or Claire, you could share it in the live chat, but I'd make them <laughs> I'd make them wait until yeah. the end. So. For dramatic effect. There you go. Well, on with our story, shall we? I told I have I actually have a lot of notes for this story. I love this story. I really do. Good. Well, then um, we've shared a PDF of a facsimile of the adventure of Rygate Squire as it was originally published in the June 1893 issue of the Strand magazine. You can download that on the Rosebeck's Sherlock Mondays page. And just even before we started, the title mm. of this adventure in the Strand, as it was originally published, and in the American Strand was The Adventure of the Rygate Squire. Mm -hmm. And then, but it was also published in Harper's Weekly in America, and that title was The Rygate Puzzle. Puzzle. Yeah. And and then it went, and then when the book edition came out, the memoirs. Conan, it was called The Adventure of the Rygate Squires, Squires plural. So Just to like, make it totally confusing for all parties. What it was, um, the here's a here's a picture of the uh Harper's page with the puzzle on it. Um it was um I mean, it's a whole magazine, it was a magazine, and you can see the full page here. Oh, yeah. And like up top, it is, you know, it's the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And then just the title is here, just beginning over the story. This is the hmm. Rag Gate. And I'm pretty sure this is how they did, you know, their titles. Um, we'll have a, we'll, ha we'll see this a couple times because the, where they, the way they share the clue is, is slightly uh, altered as well. Not in text, but um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll share a little bit more of this to start, but the Rag Gate puzzle, which I mean, I I I I I think they made the choice. I mean, they made the choice of what they wanted to change it to. I right. I um, but it is. Um, oh, somebody asked, "Was this the story on one page?" No, it was. It's it's over three different pages that the story runs. So, and the last page, even it didn't fill it. So there's a poem. So, um, not one by you know. Uh, uh, Claire, but just another. Unless book. Claire is a time traveler, which there you is... go. Well, she could be. So we don't know uh, through the Looking Glass. Yeah, Rygate Puzzle or Rygate Squire. I mean, it's I don't. It, it kind of works, um, but uh, um, this is the well. There might be an answer to that a little later. An that, answer to the puzzle, as it were. Yeah. Well, an answer to why they took Squire out. Mm, okay. I have a note on that. Nice. Love that. I'm here for the notes. All righty. Well, this and uh, this has one of the great beginnings here. Um, yeah, read read the opening uh, two sentences there. I love this opening. It was some time before the health of my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, recovered from the strain caused by his immense exertions in the spring of 87. The whole question of the Netherlands Sumatra Company and of the colossal schemes of Baron Oof, Mal. Malpertius are too recent in the minds of the public and are too intimately concerned with politics and finance to be fitting subjects for this series of sketches. <laughs> I my job. Great. Unpublished. I love, you know, another unpublished case. We love those when we see them. Um, and and the name the Netherlands Sumatra Company and the colossal schemes of Baron. Uh, Melpertuis or whatever, however you say that. Um, I, I want that story. Uh, I'm, and right? I'm sure it's been written. So I'm sure there's, you know, I'm sure. That there's... is the great fun of Sherlockiana is for, for every name dropped case, there are like two or three pastiches yeah. that are just bananas. Um, 
you can find, yeah, you can definitely find uh, somebody's done this as a uh, uh, as a pastiche. Um, yep. But then the other, you know, it was too intimately concerned with politics and finance to be a fitting subject for this series of sketches. Nah, -uh, no, no, we great. talk about this shit all the time. <laughs> I love that. Please give me politics and finance, and you know that would be fun. I mean, technically, that was, um, or at least the finance part was the stockbroker's clerk. Yeah. So. Um, Watson signed an NDA, it sounds like, <laughs> with the oh. uh, Netherlands Sumatra Company. And then he says that, um, but but Watson says, my, um, this, this case gave my friend an opportunity of demonstrating the value of a fresh weapon among the many with which he waged his lifelong battle against crime. Um, so... I don't, I, or I'm sorry, I should read the whole sentence because it led, however, in an indirect fashion to a singular and complex problem, which gave my friend an opportunity of redemption. Mm -hmm. So him solving that leads him to then do this Rygate case. I'm reading that correctly there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. able to bring, you know, a fresh kind of, you know, weapon to it, which is, you know, had he not shown up at this place, it never would have gotten solved, right? It would just yeah. been uh, the country squires would have just chalked it up. There's another robbery gone wrong, and and it never would have happened. So exactly, it's Holmes so funny because I read that sentence and I'm like, oh, the fresh weapon is uh, malingering. That that is the fresh weapon that he is the what malingering. He yeah. decides that he's gonna... <laughs> <laughs> that is the weapon Holmes brings in this story, in addition to his his powers of deduction. What well, Watson gives us a date, uh, the 14th of April, uh, mm -hmm. he gets a telegram from Lyon uh, in which uh, he finds out that Holmes is ill at the Hotel du Long. His iron constitution had broken down under the strain of an investigation which had extended over two months. He never worked less than 15 hours a day and had more than once, as he assured me, kept to his task for five days at a stretch. So... Sherlock being Sherlock, this is what he does. If he's hot he on a cake, he's not stopping. No, he has no Watson to tell him. But Holmes, your help. But and then that well, that, then he says he's gotten all these telegrams, you know, of congratulations. Then when Europe was ringing with his name. Oh, I love that. And when his room was literally ankle deep with congratulatory telegrams, it's such a great image of just like Watson wading through the hotel room telegrams and Holmes just like laid out. I think it's the first time that he's mentioned his fame abroad. Mm. As we've done so far he's of course mentioned that he's been involved in other cases and of course scandal in bohemia starts with right. you know one that involved you know uh, uh, the, the, the continent um but i th i think this might be the first case where he talks about how you know he is famous outside of um england as yeah. well and then uh and which, which just kind of adds to that it winds up adding to that mystique that Doyle is creating about the detective, both in the stories, but also in reality. As readers are, you know, encountering this, it's like, oh, yes, this is the most famous detective I've ever read. And they're talking about it each other. In real life, he's becoming that famous. It's but true. but he's not yet that famous in, in the publishing world. He's not he's not been he's not been translated yet in Europe, right. I don't think. Right. Uh, none of that, none of that. It doesn't really happen to the 20th century when you know, Sherlock leaves for a while and then comes back that suddenly, you know, there's, you know, Russian and French translations running, you know, constantly as the stories are coming out. One of the very cool things um, about the home stories and how long they run for and how long Conan Doyle is writing them um, is you do go from that conceit in the stories where Holmes is this like bright young amateur who is doing all the, the actual detective work but gets no credit in the official press um, and is sort of out there hustling and then that illusion just can't be sustained within the world of the stories because his fame as a character bleeds through into the real world yeah. and it's funny to watch Conan Doyle have to pivot with that um, that Holmes has to become a famous figure in the in the text because he is such a a, a well-known figure outside of it. 
Um, and it's just amazing to to watch and to wonder, you know, if 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 Conan Doyle had had his way um, and had been able to do the two sets of stories and that's it. Yeah. If we would have seen um, Holmes, the sort of master sage detective um, evolve. Yeah. And we would have only had one set of stories. And then that's true. We only would have had one. But, he already yeah. had his arm twisted during the second set. So, and they were so popular and they were meeting how much money he was going to get for them. So, you know, it's grumble, grumble, grumble. He didn't want to, but did. Oh, <laughs> sure. You know, <laughs> and then so we still get great. And we still get great stories even towards the very end. We do. Uh, we do. And uh, I'm, I'm a very much a casebook apologist. There's a lot of gold in the casebook yeah. um, that people have tended to kind of dismiss um because it has some of the 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 less popular stories in it um but now that everything's out of copyright i think we're really going to see more circulation we're going to see those those stories showing up more and more and cases that really deserve the love blanche soldier um i think people will become more familiar with good well in this story first watson brings him back to baker street but then he promises let's take holmes needs a rest he does he? he he you know why is he collapsed is it really because of the exhaustion or is it because the case is over well right. i think this, this is, is an be, interesting this, this we'll, we'll see what happens once they get on another case but uh yeah. watson recommends a week of springtime in the country my old friend mm-hmm. colonel hater who had come under my professional care in afghanistan by the way did you know i was once in the military <laughs> in afghanistan so he can't help talking about his can't help it less than one year's service <laughs> Watson. He's double wounding. Um, he has um, a house near Rygate yes. uh, in Surrey and wants Holmes to come come down. And Holmes, though, once he understood, go ahead, read that. No once girls, he, no girls. Yeah. A little diplomacy was needed. But when Holmes understood that the establishment was a bachelor one and that he would be allowed the fullest freedom, he fell in with my plans. And a week after our return from Lyon, we were under the colonel's roof. Bachelor week, baby. Bachelor week, no chicks. Keggers, tattoos. Absolutely. Like the hangover, the movie, (laughs) like they did it first. (laughs) With Sherlock. (laughs) Speaking of no boys, give me just one second. I'll be right all righty gotta go resolve an issue mary has to go let someone into her uh place here she's the only one with the key um they um uh and then as as soon as they're there you know resting um uh holmes is they're sitting in the colonel's gun room after dinner with holmes stretched upon the sofa and this is where i want to share an image, uh, a Sydney Paget image here from the story, and here it is with Holmes lounging on the sofa at a friend's house. I've mentioned this before. How you know we we, we we've had a few pictures. This is actually the fourth. Gloria Scott cardboard box um blue carbuncle and now this one where we get a illustration of holmes lounging upon a sofa love it and uh and for me it's just a little ah, i i think it i think it just kind of makes him not quite the respectable hero that victorian men are supposed to be um in doing i love watson's wagging finger yeah in in the illustration but Holmes is just going to chill out and relax. It's bachelor week. He can do what he bachelor wants. Week. So he gives it's the gun room. So Paget's giving us some, some rifles in the wall here, a couple guns just stick stuck on the wall. Um, and, uh, but hanging out in the gun room after dinner, as one does. As, as one, one does on bachelor weekend. Yes. Hang out in the gun room. I keep the pistols away from sherlock though so or if you respect your walls yeah absolutely find your walls you know bullet pocked with initials maybe that is the activity this weekend at uh (laughs) country Country then it would become a hangover movie right this is absolutely yeah shooting the walls and doing we just need a tiger it's it's good we'll go back to um oh gosh uh grimesley broilat's place and scoop up (laughs) the moon and uh, some other exotic critters 
someone did ask a question why they're wearing tails at boys night out you still you still wear your evening wear for dinner there's no oh, yeah. you know, there's no changing that um yeah uh, i feel like that's more about class than it is about yes. um occasion yeah well they find out from the colonel as they're sitting there that <laughs> the colonel mentions i'll take one of these pistols upstairs in case we have an alarm just drops uh, that in yeah I'm just going to take a pistol to bed with me. And uh, apparently uh, old Acton, who was one of our county magnets, had his house broken into last Monday. Um, uh, and no, the fellows are still at large and homes right away. No, no clue. clue. <laughs> <laughs> you can see him kind of like yeah. pulling up from the sofa. like. Hmm? And the colonel's like, ah, it's nothing. It's too small for you. And yeah. Yeah. I like the Holmes waved away the compliment. <laughs> his smile showed that it had pleased him, right? That, okay. you know, yeah, that uh, that Holmes ego is there from the beginning. Absolutely, it's there. The, no, no, I don't need the praise. Tell me more. But of course, he asks, but, but he asks about this, any feature of interest. And he says they ransacked the library, but took like a, a bunch of odd things, an odd volume of Pope's Homer, Two pleated ca plated candlesticks, an ivory letter weight, a small oak barometer, and a ball of twine. I they somebody even noticed the ball of twine was gone. Hey, wait, where's my ball of twine? Right, like how do you? <laughs> it's got the makings of um uh, gosh, I'm losing the titles of my cases. This their strength may be better than I than I originally thought it was. Well, this is you know, and Holmes is immediately intrigued by hearing this. Because it's an odd assortment of things. Right. And that's the exact thing, same thing that happened in Musgrave Ritual. Yes. That, I mean, well, he heard that there, there was a ritual, and so he had to hear about that. But the last case made it start with, uh, with we pulled up the linen bag, and it's got some pieces of metal and pebbles it's in it. And, wine week. I and, don't know. And what, does that, what does that mean? And then we get, it's a great setup for a story, too. It's like, this is the, the strange clue here now find out at the end what it means so yeah. here yeah. in this case it winds up it's you know it's a red herring but holmes even knows that right off the bat it's not yeah. a red herring man he knows he doesn't have to solve why somebody took a ball of twine right the barometer on the piano is in fact just there for realism it is uh just there to remind us that that sometimes just you just have random objects in your library that just get get burgled yeah um, but it is amazing that he dismisses the twine here There's, that does almost feel like a deliberate um misdirection after the that was so important in the in the last yes. yeah because the because you know you had to measure you know the distance mm -hmm. last time but um uh, i wonder if strand readers are like oh maybe it's a thing with the twine again right um, and but home holmes he says it, uh, when when the when the colonel's like oh they just grabbed it and they get they could get a hold of holmes grunted from the sofa, <laughs> from the sofa. Um, <laughs> He realizes, no, that's actually, and he knows right off the bat, he'll confirm yeah. this later. He knows right off the bat that this is, this was a ruse on purpose. Um, of course, Watson interrupts right away. I, that's he held, I held up a warning finger. So good. From that, from that illustration. You are here for a rest, my dear fellow. Um, for heaven's sake, don't get started on a new problem when your nerves are all in shreds. Geez, good thing there are no women here to henpack us. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us to be careful. <laughs> you know, if you smile, Sherlock, you'll feel a little better. <laughs> it's just that time of the month, Sherlock. You're fine. Walk it off. <laughs> um, I love Holmes's response to this wagging finger as the complete, overly dramatic uh, shrugging of shoulders and glance of comic resignation um towards the colonel and then they they change the subject but we know yeah. that he's a dog with a bone and he, he yeah. can't really move on from this then he's like see what i have to put up with in baker street yeah yeah <laughs> well all of watson's professional caution is wasted he says for the next morning the problem obstru obtruded itself upon us in such a way that it was impossible to ignore it uh, the colonel's butler rushes in. Have you heard the news, sir? Burglary, cried the colonel, with his coffee cup in midair. Murder. I, the whole. So good. It, it's, you know, it's, these are, these are the kind of things that have become, you know, cliche now. Even in the image of, of it happening, someone rushing oh, yeah. in. 
have you heard murder and but doyle for i think for a moderator overdoes it with the whole like i pose with the coffee cup in midair right. but that's we didn't have these cliches yet well or we did and we just don't know it but or this is the time that we were like, oh, don't do that again. That's just a little overcommitment to the bit. Um, you can sort of feel like this is the cold open before the title sequence, right? Murder. And then <laughs> Sherlock Holmes in the case of the Rygate puzzle slash squire slash squires. Well, um, even the whole, you know, the whole scheme here that's, you know, the the detective goes off somewhere and sure enough, I'm on vacation and a murder oh, yeah. happens. You know, this happens to Jessica Fletcher. This is what um, you said when you when you emailed me. You're like, it's murder, she wrote. And it, and it kind of is. <laughs> there was an episode of Columbus where he goes on a cruise and Columbo, Columbo, Columbo. Columbo where he goes on a cruise and a murder happens. I think he was in Mexico and port and a murder happens and he has to solve it because, oh, Columbo's here. Well, he can solve it or Jessica's right. here. She'll solve the case for us. Exactly. Um, These people never get a break. So the, you know, perhaps the beginning of that kind of cliche getting started in in mystery stories. I well, do love his description of the colonel's butler, though, rushing in with all of his propriety shaken out of him. Like, that is such a great line. It, it's This is such a serious thing that yeah. even the butler has his propriety shaken out of him. Not the butler. What does that look like? <laughs> I know, I know. And then the whistle. I, the colonel takes this all like pretty much in stride. Um, the butler's really upset, but the colonel's like, whoo! Well, which one was it? Was it the kid or was it the colonel? And it's neither. No, it's it's another servant. It's William the coachman. Shot no wonder the, the butler's heart. upset. Shot through the heart. Uh, I won't I won't bond you lyric. I was a little mm. concerned that that's where we not, were headed. I'm not. <laughs> We can only like infringe that. on so many copyrights. I'm not going to do it. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, it makes sense that the butler's upset. They they shot another servant. Um, he could be. And then and then he says um, he's describing to Holmes mm -hmm. uh, who it is, and he says uh, the 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 um, or where it happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the house that it happened. Pantry says, window. He's our leading squire about here is old Cunningham and a very decent fellow too. Ha ha. Here's where I'm going to mention the squire mm. thing. In the Harper's text, it says man instead of squire. Interesting. Now, it makes me wonder. I don't think that they thought American readers didn't know what a squire, a squire. was. Um, oh, wow. But... Did they, but uh, it leads me to think, did they think that that's a kind of, I don't know, was it a class thing for, for Harper's Magazine? And, and that kind of, you know, snooty title for someone as a squire, but now yeah. that they've taken it out of the title and now they've changed the only time it appears. Uh, let me do a quick search on that. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, Ed. It is the only time it appears in the story and they changed yeah. it to man. So I, it's odd, it, you know, that both times the squire appears, they've taken it out. They changed the title and they've changed it to man here. Maybe the one led to the other because they changed the title. They wanted to take it out there. I, I don't know. So, so or, yeah, or, thought... there's the question, too, that they thought it might give it away. Oh, Um that it winds up, you know, because we've all read this. It's not a, you know, a spoiler for us now, but that the, um, that it's the, the squire is the one, but I, it happened at his house. So I don't think that really gives it away. It's curious that, that they've changed it. Yeah. I think the strand has, yeah. Raggate squire, but it's got his man, which is interesting. So we cut up over this for the, Oh, Servant. Nope, nope, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, that's curious. I wonder why. Well, it wow. is um he will evidently be cut up because he was a good service and been with him for many years. Well, I hope yeah. he said that his servant was murdered yeah, uh, on his, property on his doorstep. <laughs> yeah. Kind uh, of upsetting. And and 
hater real right away thinks that oh it must have been the same guys that broke into yeah. actons and Holmes is like and stole that very singular collection um Holmes piping up from the, the sofa you can imagine again. yeah um and then he thinks it's just a little curious um he says and here's where he confirms it he says i remember that it passed through my mind that this was probably the last parish in england to which the thief where thieves will be likely to turn their attention which shows that i have still much to learn oh, okay not yet but holmes is even like wow i didn't think i'd have to solve a crime i just thought something you know it, which is interesting right after we've heard that how suspicious holmes is about um in the copper beaches about how um how suspicious he is of the sort of wide open country estates that don't have um the right social this where, yeah this is where the murders can happen and yeah. people can get away with it so but if he's not, a promise, or is he leaning into this not if sherlock is vacationing there though nope, so. nope. crime rate just skyrockets anytime he moves. <laughs> but they all get caught <laughs> it's true the incarceration rate is like 100 percent to the um yeah. So Holmes saying, oh, I still have much to learn is interesting. Mm -hmm. And then we find out he now now we now is when we start to get in some information. Now is when we as the readers and Sherlock himself are getting clues. Yeah. Um, we that, find out about the lawsuit that's going on. Yeah. That which has sucked the blood out of both of them. Um, right. Biggest estates, but not necessarily the richest estates yeah. because of this ongoing um, legal battle. And Acton has a claim on half of Cunningham's estate. And um, and then Holmes yawns. Well, all right, Watson, <laughs> I'm not going to meddle. Um, and, uh, and then the inspector shows up. Good well, morning. He has to meddle. I hope I don't intrude, but we hear that Mr. Holmes of Baker Street <laughs> is here. <laughs> It literally invites him. We thought you might like to step across, Mr. Holmes. And poor I, I hear the renowned mystery author Jessica Fletcher is staying <laughs> here. She might would like to know about this murder. Oh, so, yep. Oh, the fates are against you, Watson. And he, even Holmes can't help but laugh at poor Watson, yep. who's just foiled at every turn to be like, but you're on holiday. And he's like, nah. Of course, as soon as this all happens, though, now he leans back in his chair in a familiar attitude. I knew that the case was hopeless. He's doing yep. his little listening pose in the chair to hear everything. Definitely. And he's fine. And so it, this is what makes me wonder. Was yeah. the end of this case in, in Europe because he had worked himself to death or just because it was over? Right. Now, this because we've heard this so many times. As soon as the case mm -hmm. ends, he's... You know, he can't do anything. He's indolent. Mm -hmm. He lies around. He does cocaine yeah. um, because, you know, he's, he's bereft of, you know, solving a problem. It's so interesting the way his illness is described throughout this. And I'm sure we'll get more into it as he suffers from his attacks going through here. But um, the ambiguity with which the Victorians treat um, what we would call mental illness or mental health in general, um, and how delicate they are surrounding that uh, mind-body connection. And we, we've talked about it with brain fever several times on the show um, and, and among guests. But um, like what what is Holmes's issue when he when he gets here? We, we know that he is in a deep depression. Um, his nerves have broken down. He's lying in his sick room. Is it exhaustion? Is it depression? Like, we don't quite get the... We don't get the language of either a full commitment to physical... Um, malady um but we also it's also treated of course with some degree of physicality because i think still it would be unmanly to need a a, a proper rest cure mm -hmm. the way that a woman might i'm thinking of the i'm thinking of the yellow wallpaper right now yeah actually um and i was thinking of it when at the charlotte uh perkins gilman gilman perkins um, who writes, of course, about a woman who has been told by her husband that she's doing too much and that she needs to rest herself, right? She needs to to not trouble her pretty little head about too yeah. much thinking. And that is, in fact, the thing that ends up driving her insane. Yeah. 
Um, she gets gas lit and then goes insane from from the yeah. gas lighting. Yeah, absolutely. I, although I I can I'll try to I'll try to remember I'll, I'll try to think of one in particular. I, yeah, as far as I can recall, this does happen to men in in yeah. Victorian novels as well. That this is I mean cl clearly it's it's more likely for the woman to like you know be you know upset or or you know suffering from stress um but it's it's not unusual for it to happen to men in these stories well, it does seem to be the same cluster of what we would understand as the same cluster of symptoms but it's labeled very differently yes like um it's never hysteria when it's a man yeah. hysteria yeah. i mean obviously yeah. the, the word comes from the word for womb um but it's hysteria when it's a woman it's um nervous exhaustion nervous exhaustion man yeah. um brain fever seems to seems to be both in this period um but it's just it's curious the way that this is comes up in a lot of my research um professionally about what are the words that we use to describe um words associated with mental health and where they overlap with physical health and how does this change and who gets diagnosed with what um you know poor people go insane um, but rich people um, suffer from nerves, nerves, nervous mm -hmm. disorder. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always just curious. I, I, and and we get more um, physical symptoms from Holmes later in in, in the story, which yeah. I don't want to hold up too long. Oh, when he um, pretends, but, to but, how you know, but, but he knows that he can use those things to pretend. That, yeah, and Watson is, and we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to this, but Watson's yeah. convinced. It's yeah. it's in keeping for Watson um, with what he is sort of um, preemptively diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Another thing about this story that I, that I like to mention is that it's a country house murder mystery. Um, you know, the kind of murder mystery that was popularized in the 20th century, Agatha Christie, uh, Neal Marsh, mm -hmm. Dorothy Sayers, that kind of closed circle at a country estate you know, where you get the kind of relations between the, 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 you know, the, the upper class and the staff and something has gone wrong. Um, I, I, it, that's, that's what's going on in this story, but it's not, I, I just think it's more of a case that this is a precursor to what become, what later writers create the country house murder that I don't know. Yeah. If, those details know. get dialed up yeah. later on. Um, and in this story, it kind of, you know, it also, this story highlights how it's the kind of person least expected by the community did it. So, yeah. um, uh, and that's that's a feature that winds up getting used in the future too. Well, then once there's a bunch of them, then they've really got to play with it and mm -hmm. to keep people guessing because Doyle's not writing stories to try to get you to guess the end. Yeah. Um he he he's thought about that. Um, uh, like he, I remember the the in 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 that interview he did for the Strand before Silver Blaze came out, and he was like, "Oh, you know, and I bet you no one will be able to solve this case um, before the end." So he has it in his mind that that is actually um, uh, uh, people do think about or you know could possibly solve it, and he gives us in several stories, not all of them, but several of them. They are fair play mysteries where you do have all the clues and you just yeah. need to put it together. If you but have he does it. play with which way yeah. he wants to go. Not yeah. certainly not all of them are, are fair play. Yeah. So um the uh well, so he listens and then he hears the story. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently the uh Mr. Alec, the young squire, the you know, squire to be, or I'll just yeah. call him young squire, um, was smoking a pipe in his dressing gown. As you do. Um, which I like, yeah. I don't have a dressing gown, you know that? I have a smoking jacket. Mm. But I need, I think I need a dressing gown to smoke my pipe in sometimes. So. I'm really surprised that you don't have a dressing yeah, gown. Yeah, you know. Uh, my wife got me a really nice smoking jacket, but which which I use sometimes, especially in the winter months. Um, yeah. But I need a dressing gown. Well, and I have my choice, right, of three colors. Like it could be... You do! Blue, purple, or mouse. Or I could mouse. Get. So... Or a checker. Think about it. Put it on your on your Christmas there you list. Go. Well, Mr. Alk is smoking and he sees the murder happen. It was two men wrestling outside. One of them was Kerwin, the, the coachman, and 
one of them fired a shot and went, then dropped and then the other guy ran away. Um, Mysterious uh, villain runs off in, into the night. Yeah. Holmes Wright starts, ha- starts asking a question. He asked the most important question right away. Why was this William, what was this William doing there? Um, yeah. and, and did he say anything? Um, they think that he walked up to check on the house because, you know, they've had that robbery recently. You don't want any balls of twine stolen here. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then Holmes asked the other important question. Did he say anything to his mother before going out? Right. Um, and this poor woman, old and deaf and described as, the shock has made her half-witted, but I understand she was never very bright. There you go. Well, right. and there you go. There you go. The woman becomes half-witted. So. Yeah. Yeah, right. She's, says she's half-witted from the shock. Not, not, you know, grieving because her son was just murdered. Yeah, no, no, she's a half wit now. <laughs> she only had half to start with, I guess. She's a quarter wit or something. I don't know. This poor thing. Um, um but then but we get a clue. A clue, and it's a small t- piece of paper from a notebook, and Holmes spread it out on his knee, uh, or 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 the or the inspector did. Mm-hmm. And this is where in the story we actually get to see it as the characters saw it. Yeah. Let me share that here. It is here. It's really cool how that's presented. It is. And they show the kind of division, like here it was cut off here. Mm-hmm. Um, so you really get the you really get the impression that I'm looking at an actual clue in the um the American edition, it's not quite as cool because they take out that torn border. Oh, and okay. this is what it looks like in the Harper's text. Oh, uh, yeah. And actually, you can notice, Ooh. look at them side by side, it's that they, they had to redo it. They had to re, you know, write it here to make it. So, oh, I right. Because look, the Harper's one has the at closer yeah um at to quarter two it really shows you the um the, the running together yeah where the quarter runs down here and um, the greek ease yeah to, yeah and they really got the greek e well done here yeah uh, here it's here but not here, uh-huh. here well that's the difference though right right so that's um, really cool yeah. how they so they've that. they've done a good job of matching it but I do yeah. think it's interesting that, you know, in the printing technology, they couldn't have this just duplicated and sent to them. It was just yeah. a lot easier for them, likely, to have it redone on the page here. That's fine. And and they've also taken out the, the fact that it's torn. So <laughs> while you get the impression that this is what they're looking like, this is like almost, this is like a facsimile of the clue. It's very and, cool. Um, that kind of thing is it's kind of a big deal i think it's something the strand or it's something the strand doesn't realize is a big deal mm-hmm. like later you get lots of uh in the 20th century you get books published that do this kind of thing where they've got all the clues and like some of them come in little pouches and you could take mm-hmm. them out yeah and yeah mysteries this is like the 1930s i think there's some like this um but that that you know in the end i think that the strand that i don't think doyle realized that the reading public would love to see all the clues and solve the case in that way you know like the puzzle aspect even though in american it's called the raggy puzzle (laughs) i don't think it's developed enough for them to like you know really and it doesn't happen again in you know what or it happens we get a couple sparingly. We get maps sometimes. I yeah. think hand drawn. Um, the one with the was it the stockbroker's clerk or it's a different case where there um, there's a break in and somebody like redraws the what the setup yeah. of the office looks like. Um, but yeah, that sort of immersive experience um, of reading mysteries. Because this is very much like the, I mean, in this story, this is an immersive you know thing in this story that the readers get to see the clue on the page. In a really interesting, like second person kind of presentation, as opposed to what the illustrations give you, which is yeah. just the, the sort of outside third person um, perspective. It is really cool. I like the torn page. Um, it's a nice effect. Really, really well, interesting. Now the theories start to come in. The inspector thinks that Kerwin might have been involved, um, mm-hmm. even though he had a reputation of being honest. He might have been in league with them, and then they had a falling out. Um, but Holmes right away is 
this writing is of extraordinary interest. <laughs> um, you know, they are, these are much deeper waters than I had thought. And, um, uh, and then I love this. The inspector smiled at the effect which his case had upon the famous London specialist. Um, well, we've got a good murder. <laughs> Holmes is intrigued. Love it. Love the description that we get of the change that comes over Holmes in the yes. next paragraph. Um, he starts sort of spinning, right, as the possibility of being an understanding between the burglar. It's interesting, but the writing opens up and he cuts himself off. And we've got this. He sank his head into his hands again and remained for some minutes in the deepest thought. When he raised his face again, I was surprised to see that his cheek was tinged with color and his eyes as bright as before his illness. He sprang to his feet with all his old energy. He is cured. So. He's cured. It's the opposite of a rest cure. There's another point in uh, the column for, for your <laughs> diagnosis, Ed. But he's just, he needs stimulation, not rest. Yes, you need some rest, Holmes. No, I need another case. Just needs a nap is what he needs. I like, too, that he's, um, um he compliments the inspector. And, and he does that more than once, I think, in this story. That, you yeah. know, um, uh, he says... Uh, um, uh, it's ingenious, not entirely impossible supposition. Um, you know, that, that kind of, you know, that Holmes knows, and he said this in the past that you need imagination mm -hmm. to figure out what these clues are. Um, and, uh, well, imagination, you know, and then, you know, then you propose a solution and then see if it works kind of, you know. It's thing. interesting, right? Because you don't yeah. want to theorize without data, but at the same time, yeah. you need to have imagination. It's this very yeah. delicate balance um, of how to be a good detective. Um, imaginative without um, projecting your theories yes. onto the case. Well, he's cured now. And uh, now... He leaves to investigate. <laughs> the transition we get of him leaving to investigate and being like, I'll be back in half an hour. Yeah. And he just heads out, starts investigating. Um, half hour <laughs> elapsed. The inspector returns alone. He's still An walking hour and a half there. elapses. Hour He's and a half. back in yeah. 30 minutes. He's gone for three times that duration. And then he doesn't even come back. He's still walking around, and then, uh, and then the inspector's like, "I don't think he's gotten over his illness yet. He's behaving so queerly." I don't uh, think he's okay. Yeah. Watson says, "I have usually found that there was indeed method in his madness." So, which he <laughs> forgets like, then later. Yeah, so. he's like, he's just like this. Like it's fine. he's fine. He's just he always does this. Yeah, Watson doesn't doubt that you know Sherlock is you know uh, uh, he's fine now. Yeah, this is normal erratic behavior for Holmes. Not not erratic, erratic behavior. Well, they go and they find Holmes still out in the field, pacing up and down, thinking. Um, uh, Watson, He's had a charming morning. <laughs> yes, Watson, your country trip, trip has been a distinct success. So, um, it's very charming, very charming investigating a murder. A murder, yeah. Yes. Not the not the charming time that some of us want from our bachelor week, but for <laughs> homes, that's what You've it got is. Other plans. They uh, he just... rolls with it though. Like you have to respect. Like this is definitely one of Watson's friends because, like, there's a murder next door to him, and he's just rolling with it. He's he's like tagging along on the investigation. He's not freaked out by this. He's like, huh, huh. So what do you think's going on? cool to watch you work mr holmes like this is pretty fun mm -hmm. um definitely one of watson's friends <laughs> if somebody was murdered in my hometown i don't know that i would be like whoa that's so interesting you know like i, I might i might be getting out of town take a vacation of my own um before we get to they they they, they talk about the clue before we yeah. get to that i would like to um thank all of you for watching this episode as a nonprofit organization, the Rosenbach Museum and Library depends on the generosity of friends and supporters like you to keep programs like this free and accessible to hundreds of fellow Sherlockians worldwide, thousands of fellow Sherlockians worldwide. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach and Sherlock Mondays by donation, which you can do so at our website, 
or by becoming a member. Membership gives you free museum admission, discounts on programs and courses, exclusive invitations to member-only events. You can learn more about how to become a member on our website. Part of membership is early access to program and course registration. And very soon, there will be some new spring courses and programs that you can register for that we will tell you about as they go up. I think next week, I'll probably make some announcements on this show. Um, and Rosenbeck membership makes a great gift. Uh, we've had several people watching our shows who have done that gifted people memberships. Uh, I really can't stress how important your support is. So if you haven't made a donation or joined as a member or have the ability to make a further donation, I would invite you to do so and be so grateful. We also have a Facebook group page, Sherlock Mondays, for lots more Sherlockian info, news, links, conversation, and fun. It's always busy on the on the Facebook group page for Sherlock Mondays. There's an audio podcast version of this show. If you don't, it's the same show, but you don't see me drinking and smoking. Um, but the rest of it goes on just as it does. We just pull the audio off this and make a podcast out of it. So the audio podcast dropped one week after the video ones. I know several of you have been asking about Sherlock Monday's merchandise. Uh, I'll be making an announcement soon. Um, just figuring out the details because we changed the we changed we had to change the way we we get merchandise out to people. And you will have an opportunity to get Sherlock Monday's merchandise before the show ends. So that's about all I can say now. I can say that we have finalized the details for our pay only Hound of the Baskervilles show. And on the next episode, I will unveil the details and registration will be open for that on the next episode. So um, that's all I got to say today. That's exciting. Yeah, we'll finally make the announcement, you know, on the next episode and people can register for the Hound uh, program, which will be pay only, but it'll be, the, it's the same. We're going to do the same show. You're going to be on it and the other co-hosts and we'll talk about Hound of the Baskervilles in, uh, in eight parts. Uh, so that'll be fun. Well, back to this story, Holmes and the inspector are now kind of comparing notes, right? They're working discussing... together, which is nice. Yeah. Nice to see Holmes working a case with somebody. They're discussing the paper clue, the fragment of paper. Um, and um, he thinks that the inspector thinks it has, you know, the hour of his death written on it, or Holmes does, mm -hmm. um, or Watson does. Who does? Uh, does? I think that we are both agreed that this is Holmes. The fragment mm -hmm. has the has the hour of his death on it. It should give us a clue. And Holmes says, it does give a clue. Whoever wrote that note was the man who brought William Kerwin out of his bed at that hour. But where is the rest of the sheet of paper? Mm. So, um, and then why was someone so anxious to get possession of it? Because it incriminated him. If we could get the rest of that sheet, we would solve the mystery. Um, and that the suspect, Holmes thinks, doesn't even probably doesn't realize that a piece was torn off of it. So. Right. Another example of why there's nothing so as so important as trifles, right? Here's a yes. dead body sitting in a ditch, but Holmes is really curious about this piece of paper, this yep. fragment of a piece of paper. This literal tiny thing is the crux of the of the whole mystery. Um, I love this. This was um, when I was watching. Uh, I won't get off topic, but watching Night Country. Um, the new installation of True Detective, um, mm -hmm. Jodie Foster's characters, were not asking the right questions. And yeah. that to me is so like Sherlock Holmes. Very Sherlockian, yeah. Gotta ask the right questions. Um, and the question isn't like, who killed William and why? It's where's the rest of the paper? Why did the murderer go so far? to try to keep like get this paper out of the dead man's hand like what's so important about the paper um so i love that the idea of asking the right questions um is a legacy that we're still seeing in um in shows in all yeah. The mysteries. Yeah. yeah so they're looking for the paper they've got to oh. get into the criminal's pocket but yeah they don't know who the criminal is so that's tricky 
And Holmes also uh, finds out that um, the the um, it was it was it was delivered by the Afternoon Post, but the envelope was destroyed. Right. And then uh, and then Holmes has another compliment for the inspector. You've seen yeah. the postman. It's a pleasure to work with you. <laughs> I don't think he's being, you know, there's no. times when he's with the police, when he's being so sarcastic towards him. So condescending. This isn't one of those. He's, no. he's like, this is great. You mean not only you have a an inspector, but your inspector actually does work to solve a crime. Usually, they're a just, usually they just say like, oh, it's this. And then they don't listen to anything. Right. So, yeah. He loves this. It's great. Um, Do you have any comments about the Queen Anne house? Because I had to look this this little reference up. The Queen Anne house? No, I yeah, don't. It bears the, the date. Of, oh, um, the oh the map 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 on the on the door. Yeah. yeah. I had a note in um uh in my Leslie Klinger. Klinger, of course. Um, <laughs> Leslie, I'm not surprised. And it's just, ah, yeah. Yeah, this feels like a clinger note in the best possible way. Because I read this and was like, what? And went to Wikipedia um, for this. But I just thought this was such a weird. That would be 1709. This is yeah. last year. That would be 1709, the year in which 100,000 British, Austrian, and Dutch soldiers clashed with 90,000 French in the last major battle of the War of Spanish Succession, fought near the village of Malplaquet, 10 miles south of Mont. The engagement forced the French to retreat, but there were heavy casualties on the Allied side, preventing them from advancing to Paris. It is a fun thing, though, that that Doyle puts that reference yeah. in there. That like, Why not just of course, you like, all remember the Battle of Mount Piquet, right? Yeah, so that's when. They... Like, oh, it's 1709. He's like, it's an 18th century house. Like, oh, the Mount, the, the date of the Mount Piquet around the lintel of the door. Like, what is that? I love Why? that. That's somebody who likes military history. And yeah, it probably yeah. yeah. It's one in there, one in there for the boys for boys weekend for for military <laughs> history campaigns for trivia night at the pub. Like here's here's Conan Doyle like big brain move working into the future of of Sherlockian trivia. Like yeah. he doesn't even know Sherlockians of the future just like <laughs> living for these little details. I could see this being in a dastardly Sherlockian quiz, right? Like well, I want Sherlock on. <laughs> my uh on my trivia team that's for Absolutely. sure 100 percent. unless unless it's about the solar system <laughs> <laughs> poison's amazing that's maybe that's what watson was doing he was just like screening oh wait, yeah everyone. well technically it's watson right because this is yeah. the uh... oh yeah that's true yeah this is yeah, watson, this is watson. So it's like yeah. military history uh, he knows that of course he's got colonel you know or general gordon on his wall and God. yeah Lots of feature. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have like, you've got to have the two of them on your trivia team. I mean, I, it is funny to reframe it that way, right? Like sitting there evaluating your new roommate to see if he will be good for your trivia team. Doesn't know anything about the solar system. He knows some things about <laughs> plants, but only if the plants will kill you. Um, he knows a disturbing amount about poison and a lot about like geography. No, just dirt. He knows a lot about dirt. Um, I'm only inviting Sherlock for true crime trivia. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Solar system, you're fired. Um, so yeah, we pass this little Queen Anne oh. house. They come around then, to the side of the gate. And then he goes, he looks at the... Uh, well, this is the scene of the crime. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, but as they're, and as they're there, uh, two men came down the garden path. Uh, one was elderly with a strong, deep-lined, heavy-eyed face. The other, a dashing young fellow whose bright, smiling expression and showy dress were in strange contrast with the business which had brought us there. Are we supposed to, like, suspect him immediately? Young, flashy, you know, you know. No idea, no idea uh, because he's, he's, like, dashing, right? Like, how can we not trust him? But also... And then he's mean to Sherlock right off the bat. Immediately mean. Yeah. Um, I thought you, uh, well, the I think the, um, uh, yeah, I thought you Londoners were never at fault. You don't seem to be very quick after all. And, right. Still you know, at I, it I then. I don't, I don't see we have any clue. 
Um, and then when the inspector starts to mention about the paper. Yeah. We've only found, and then immediately. Holmes has his attack. His eyes rolled upwards, his features writhed in agony, and with a suppressed groan, he dropped on his face upon the ground. <clears throat> Holmes has fainted for the first and only time in his life. <laughs> we'll get to that. Sorry. We'll get to that later, people. Sorry. <laughs> I, I shouldn't have said that. No, um, you're good. <laughs> they don't have any context, so they have no idea. There you go. Um, um what is this though like it looks like it's going to be a seizure and then it's not it's just fainting yeah. and then they carry him into the kitchen and then he makes a shamefaced apology for his weakness for his weakness i've been liable to these sudden nervous attacks yeah because he doesn't faint he does the whole right. like uh and you know goes down yeah it's a nervous yeah. attack yeah. it's not fainting that's like yes. not yeah not banging. we could be banging his head on the wall like uh you know bothered with him in uh, the other story yeah, yeah. <laughs> my brother's stories tonight either <laughs> <laughs> this is a good cocktail isn't it uh <laughs> yeah, it's tasty. i like this i made another while you were talking I, you could probably say i i turned my, I turned <laughs> I my, your I turned my audio you. off for the so i could shake i it saw the shaking off. and didn't hear it and <laughs> had ice so i made a sound so. nice nice um so should we send you home in my trap? Yeah. So no, I'm 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 I might as well I may as well ask you questions. <laughs> He's gonna do his Columbo thing. Just, yeah. just one more thing while I'm here. Uh, one more thing. Uh, oh, like, where was he sitting when uh, he saw the uh, <laughs> out the window? So he, he asked Columbo all, hates when I don't hang up yeah. my dressing gown. You know? like, <laughs> <laughs> um. He's asking them questions about what they saw. Mm -hmm. Holmes right away is like, well, if the lights were on, why did the burglar try to break in? Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> he must have been a cool hand. <laughs> yeah, old Cunningham says he must have been a cool hand. It would, would be a better life from Alec, but but the young, but but the old one says it. And I that, that's awesome too, because that's a taunt. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, and and or 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 a brag, but in it a is. sense, like, yeah, he must have been a cool hand. Because it was us. Yeah, exactly. It's like, um, what a handsome murderer that must have been. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been a dashing young fellow and really smart. Um, <laughs> that is really funny. He didn't um, steal anything. And then Holmes is like, oh, we remember this is a peculiar burglar um, uh, from the strange thing he took from Actons, what was it? The ball of string, a letter mate, and odds of ends. So he's like, I don't know what other odds and ends. He knows what other odds. And yeah, ends. and but Holmes is kind of, you know, yeah. If he had, he's figured it out already, and now he's like, he's playing with them in a sense, yeah. and he's right. leaning into that, like, oh, I'm not firing on all cylinders, kind yeah. of thing, which then happens right when he like makes a mistake about the the time of the crime he suggests now you offer a reward but then he writes the wrong time on it yeah. and, and then watson gets secondhand embarrassment over the whole <laughs> thing like i feel for watson here right i was pained at the mistake for i knew how keenly holmes would feel any slip of the kind it was his specialty to be accurate as to fact but his recent illness had shaken him and this one little incident was enough to show me that he was still far from being himself he was obviously embarrassed for an instant while the inspector raised his eyebrows and alec cunningham burst into a Poor Watson. Watson is like, oh. I, I don't think the reader thinks. I think I think Watson falls for it. And I think yeah. this is one of those cases, one, one of those instances where the reader also realizes, like, come on. He's laying it on thick, you know? Um, and but Watson buys it. And um uh I I, I don't think the reader does. Um no. we also no, get I also don't think that Watson is trying to trick us here like I really read this the way yeah. that's described like I yeah. really read this as he's remembering how mortified he was on Holmes's behalf even though he knows how it all shakes out and he uh, like there are times I feel like where Watson plays up his own like fumbly Nigel Bruce-esque bumblingness right like for our benefit 
And you're like, come on, Watson, you would know that. I know that you would know that. Um, this doesn't feel like that. This feels like the 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 way it's described to me, I was just like, oh, this is like the same reason I can't watch the American office. Like this secondhand embarrassment is just, I, it's too much and I can't take it. And I feel like this is Watson remembering his own reaction to the situation. And it shows how close they are and the it's friendship crazy. that they have. That, it's you know, that's crazy. another example of these, you know, these are two men that feel a great deal for each other. It's very sweet. We also get a reminder here, too, um, uh, uh, about the, um, when Holmes asks him to do the, to send the reward, uh, said the JP, the Justice of the Peace. He's called Justice of the Peace earlier, too, when, we, when he first hear about him. And, and the irony that the, the Justice of the Peace, the person who is in charge of meeting out justice in this area mm -hmm. is the is one of the criminals in this case can't trust anybody well the squire laughs and um but holmes gets him to gets his father to write the um uh the 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 real the, write the words mm -hmm. order 212 yeah so, has him correct it physically. now he has now he has his handwriting sample Holmes put the slip of paper carefully away in his pocketbook. Um, so uh, he's he's got the evidence. Well, he's got partially he's got what he needs to then clarify further. He's he wants to get the actual you know sheet. Building the case, he knows where it, he knows at this point. You're right, how it shakes out, but he's gathering evidence so that he can prove it. Yeah. And he's trying to, you know, now he's asking questions. He's trying, I think he's trying to get them off, you know, off of his suspecting them, them that he knows anything that, oh, I just had some more questions. Um, Checking Watson, to see if the, the lock has been forced. Watson says, I could tell from his expression that he was on a hot scent. And yet I could not the least imagine, I could at least imagine in what direction <laughs> we're leading it more and more. We're getting it. We're getting yeah. the, the Watson. Like I have no idea what's going on. I, I shouldn't me. say more and more. It's it's always been there. But <laughs> I think I think the effect you have in reading the stories is over time it starts mm -hmm. to have an effect on you, and you it does lead you to start to think that Watson isn't that smart. But yeah. I think it's only because it's a repetition of the same thing happening that he doesn't understand something, and will say I don't understand something. Right. Um, right. which is actually the way to get smart yes, um, is to admit that you don't know what it is and then you get it explained yeah. to you. Um, Watson's a great student. There's also that hot, hot scent and that I think it's still, this is still a new thing for that using that hunting metaphor for mm. criminal investigation. Um, the, the scent to solve a, a a mystery or a puzzle had already been used for you know over a hundred years now. You can find a few you can find examples of it, but now it's in particular to the detective. And it's not the first time in Sherlock Holmes stories. It's it's happened before where you know Holmes is hot on the scent like a bloodhound, mm -hmm. you know that hunting, but it's hunting in the city or you know for to solve a crime. Here it's in the countryside as well, but. It, but it's particularly tied to to a detective solving a crime. Yeah, which is and we often need how you see it, hear it. You know, I think you hear that on the scent more with crime yeah. solving than anything else now. Yeah, and we see in the home stories the move from the literal being on the scent in the sign of the four, where they take Toby out yeah. to literally trace the scent, and then we get the metaphor of Holmes as the bloodhound um, on the scent of the crime do a quick search and see what other stories it's in but mm. i mean the right scent this is toby in the beginning here toby. A but good then, boy. yeah but then no it's you know it's it's right away with uh other cases right off the bat it, it winds yeah. up being used frequently by doyle it's it's a it's uh, something that he probably has a hand in popularizing to use mm -hmm. for criminal investigation I say probable because I don't, I haven't done the full investigation. I don't know, but it does sound probable. And I would love to hear from um, our, our listeners if they've done research in that direction. The son makes fun of him about that. He sucks. Yeah. You must try around and get on a fresh scent, I fancy, with his malicious smile. Well. Love Holmes walking around taking keen note of the architecture of the house. Yeah. 
just making everybody think he's a weirdo just leaning yeah. into the weirdness and then he gets the man into the chamber he holds back and as they go into one room and then read that as we passed it go ahead <laughs> what <laughs> Uh, as we moved, it, oh, as we passed it, Holmes, to my... I'm sorry, wait, we skipped. We threw the set near the foot of the bed. There you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hi, God. Near the foot of the bed. Near the foot of the bed. It's one sentence before, that's all. Oh, yeah. Near the foot of the bed stood a dish of oranges and a carafe of water. The inspiration for this drink. Um, as we passed it, Holmes, to my unutterable astonishment, leaned over in front of me and deliberately knocked the whole thing over. The glass smacked ashed into a thousand pieces and the fruit rolled about into every corner of the room. You've done it now, Watson, he said coolly. A pretty mess you've made of the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's funny. So and it just, you know, and it looks funny too. Like they're walking around and all of a sudden Holmes is like, uh, push the table over. <laughs> you've done it now, Watson. <laughs> Orange is rolling across the room. Like the illustration's pretty good in the strand. Do you have that handy? I have yeah, my, my like reader's copy, but I mean, I'm just like Here's straight the... up pushing the, the thing over. Like, <laughs> like Watson's nowhere near it. There he is. <laughs> hey, Watson looking like, my brother, what are you doing? <laughs> what ineffable twaddle is this? <laughs> what the deuce? <laughs> I love it. And it is. The orange is all over the floor here. This must have been so much fun for Paget to do. Yeah. It's like I get to draw oranges rolling all over the and place. And Holmes like, has got this like little mischievous look going on here on his face. Look at that. Yeah, because I mean, if people are being if people are being rude to you, why not just like break their shit? Yeah. You <laughs> I'm just gonna <laughs> knock your stuff over here. <laughs> I had a nervous fit. Sorry, I broke your Waterford vase. Like, no. Well, but they're. I'm not they're well. There, this there is a method to his madness. He um uh he does it to create a diversion. And then Watson he, picks up the fruit. Everybody's like confused. Everybody blames Watson. I love that. He's like understanding for some reason that my companion desired me to take the blame upon myself. The others did the same. <laughs> like everybody else is like, yeah, Watson. But, but then Cunningham's realized he's gone. They run into the other room. They think he's off his head. And then we hear a sudden scream of help, help, murder. With a thrill, I recognize the voice as that, as that of my friend. I rushed madly from the room onto the landing. I love Watson, heroic here, right? Oh, good. Cries, which had sunk down into a hoarse, inarticulate shouting, came from the room which we had first visited. I dashed in and on into the dressing room beyond. The two Cunninghams were bending over the prostrate figure of Sherlock Holmes, the younger clutching his throat with both hands, while the elder seemed to be twisting one of his wrists. In an instant, the three of us had torn them away from him, and Holmes staggered to his feet, very pale and evidently greatly exhausted. Arrest these men, Inspector! <laughs> on what charge? That of murdering their coachman, William Cohen! <laughs> dun, dun, dun! Amazing. The picture, Not a the picture's good, too. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, this is a good one, too. Paget must have had a great time with this. There story. they are. I mean, choking him out here and trying Seriously. to get the paper. Um, they Twisting are very the serious wrist. about this. So, um, but the whole, you know, arrest them. Watch out for murder of William. Co like, it be it's become a cliche. And, it has. It's, it's not quite a cliche yet. It is. It's it just is drama. Something you encounter on stage, of course, especially. Mm -hmm. And you encounter it in these kind of stories. But... You know, it is, uh, you know, you can't get away with that kind of scene now without it seeming yeah. silly. Um, right. Although you sort of accept it from Holmes because you know that he's got a flair for the dramatic. It is. And, and part of it is that, you know, uh, dramatic flair that he wants to create this scene, yeah. of, you know, where, where this can all occur. Um, and he does and he has. Um, uh He's he's the inspector's like, what? No, you don't mean that. And he's like, look at their faces. They're completely guilty. <laughs> I love that too. Like you can imagine them like pan over, and the two of them are just like, 
like so guilty and then the son of course you know um he had dropped all that jaunty dashing style which had characterized him and the ferocity of a dangerous wild beast gleamed in his dark eyes and distorted his hand handsome features and then he starts to pull out a gun yeah and, you know um oh would you drop it he stuck out i, I love out that Just... yeah so um it is interesting that the handsome man the the the, the mask of his handsome face gives way, right? He, yeah. he the eyes become he becomes distorted. Um, he becomes ugly as we see that he is, in fact, ugly on the inside. Um, we're still leaning a little bit into that Victorian uh, physiognomy. And Holmes and Doyle lets the inspector knock the you know knock the gun out of his hand and kind of you know do that. That it's not something that Holmes does, and it's not something that Watson comes in and does. Yeah. It, he gives it to the inspector. This inspector is good. He's like, he, he's not even, you know, he, Cunningham doesn't get to drop on him. So uh -uh. that's what Holmes did in the uh, um, Redheaded League. He's the one that knocks the gun out of the yeah. hand of John Clay. You yeah, know. Because everybody bitched about having to do their late night camp out. So he was like, fine. <laughs> 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 oh, it's late. Oh, it's dark. I'm, I'm missing work for the, you know, like. I'm missing my, uh, I'm, missing <laughs> I'm missing my weekly card game. Yeah, exactly. So. Wist for this yeah pretty much um but yeah it's this is a great inspector it's a shame we don't it's a shame we don't see more well wait, do we even get his name i don't know that we do he's the local inspector he's just the inspector i don't think we even get his name in this story which is a shame oh inspector forrester oh it is we do inspector forrester thank you yeah good good i'm glad i would that would make me really sad if we didn't yeah, well, like not the only name we only wrote. Well, we get a name, but we don't know anything about at the end of the very end of the story. Weird. But the um, yeah. he has the dramatic accusation. They're guilty. Um, he's got he's found the message in the in the dressing gown um, that he had, that that's what Holmes thought happened. He just put it in yep. his dressing gown, didn't realize that there was a piece torn from it. And then Holmes goes off to with the inspector to ask some more questions because you know he loves having all the details. He can't stand not to have any little details cut out of it. Where was the rope? Yeah. Did you bring your own rope? <laughs> so um what the, happened to the twine? Yeah. So um yeah. Why did you take the why did you choose? The twine? <laughs> you can see this being a um they um but he comes back as good as his word to explain the case to the colonel's smoking room. Um and with him, he brings Mr. Acton, who is robbed first. And it was his case against the Cunninghams that they knew about as mm -hmm. well. And um, he's going to um, uh, give them the, tell them what happened. And he also says, I'm afraid, my dear Colonel, that you must regret that the hour, you must regret the hour that you took in such a stormy petrol as I am. What a great expression, huh? The stormy petrol which is a bird, everyone, that um, uh, that uh, the petrol is, when, when you see the petrol, you know a storm is coming. It's a harbinger of a coming storm or danger so, for sailors. So, What a little yeah, emo kid he is. I love that for him. What's that? I said, what a little emo kid he is. He just like, it's like, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a harbinger of doom. You know? like, I bet you regret it. Um, like, no, this is why Watson and I are buds. Like, I think this yeah. is great. Like, this is, I consider it my greatest privilege to have been permitted to study your methods of working. I confess they quite surpassed my expectations that I am utterly unable to account for your result. I have not yet seen the vestige of a clue. Yes. And, you know, Holmes is, you know, he's sorry that I'm going to disillusionize you because it's always been my habit to hide none of my methods either from my friend watson or from anyone who might take an intelligent interest in them of course they're always revealed at the end by the end yeah. but now he's been so shaken up that i think that i shall help myself to a dash of your brandy the With brandy this? cure i love the brandy <laughs> cure in these stories so. oh, it's there you go. The only real doctoring we get needs is a bandaged. little brand. That's all we needed. I needed, you know, to re to recoup. I just needed a murder to solve and a brandy. It's there amazing. You. A couple people to make an attempt on my life. Oh. Precious laws <laughs> to ruin. Carafe, rather. 
Um, the, I love this. I trust that you had no more of those nervous attacks. And you, ha, 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 we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll come to that in time. And then he lays first, off. First, let me give you a lecture on the art of detection. <laughs> and which he, you know, which he starts to give here, you know, recognize which facts are important. Yeah. Scrap of paper, you know, because of course, if Alex Cunningham's account were true, then the paper wouldn't have been torn because mm -hmm. you know, they were wrestling for the gun and he wouldn't have taken the time to tear the paper out of his hand. Um, Holmes goes through the, the, the clues that have led him to realize what was going on here. Um, yeah, he does actually walk you through, right? He tells you like you have to be able to recognize um, which facts are important and which are which are incidental and which are vital. You have to have no prejudices. You have to follow docilely wherever the facts lead you. Because the um, inspector did. The inspector had a prejudice in that he just didn't think that the county magnates, the justice of peace, would have been involved. So that yeah. prevented him from, you know, looking at it with fresh eyes and realizing it that no, this is, this could be a solution to the case. Right. Could lead to a solution. <clears throat> and then we get to the examination of the paper clue once again, mm -hmm. and the examinate and the, the handwriting mm -hmm. and all of these things. I mean, just, just I'll briefly just uh, read this one. When I draw your attention to the strong T's of at and two, and ask you to compare them with the weak ones of, quarter and 12 you will instantly recognize the fact um this all of these you know handwriting things at a, several months before doyle had written this story or actually shortly before he had written the story i'm sorry he had been corresponding with alexander cargill now cargill was a writer um and uh but also um uh, he had some medical training and he had sent i think he even knew bell i think he knew dr bell um he had sent doyle an article that he had written for the edinburgh medical journal which was also edited by dr joseph bell maybe that's how he knows bell um, the man of course who doyle modeled holmes's deductive abilities on this is the kind of stuff that bell used to do with his patients mm -hmm. cargill's article article was called health in handwriting Mm. in which he posited that handwriting could reveal the mental and physical strength of the writer, even age, and sometimes even tell you if the person had mental health problems. Um, in the Baker Street Dozen, which is a collection of the 12 that. stories that Doyle picked as his favorite stories, as mm -hmm. the stories he thought was best. But each of these stories also has an essay in it. Um, and uh, there's a Rygate Squires, because Doyle picked this story as one of the 12 mm. stories that he wrote. Um, and Richard Lancelin Green, a great Sherlockian from the past, had had comment, had has a quote from the letter Doyle wrote back to Cargill after reading this health and handwriting. He says, after reading your excellent articles, I am almost afraid to write to you for fear you should discover imbecility in the dots of my eyes or incipient brain softening in my capitals. You have given me quite new ideas and I thank you for them and can recognize their truth since they tally with every man's experience, though I never saw them condensed and formulated before. I would like now to give Holmes a torn slip of a document and see how far he could reconstruct both it and the writers of it. I think, thanks to you, I could make it effective. How and cool. he did. And I didn't know that. That's so cool. And Holmes and uh, Doyle got some, you know, it, you know, he got the 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 hair being cut off and mm -hmm. saved from Copper Beaches from his mother. He mm -hmm. got this little clue idea from you know someone who's been reading his stories and sent them in and and used them. Um Great. so uh I love that. And then also in this story, he goes on about it. We get 560 words here <laughs> of handwriting analysis in this book. That's, it, I, you know, I read the beginning of it, and then it goes for 560 words about the handwriting in the story. 
Sherlock um, Holmes, amateur graphologist. Poe would have loved this. Poe oh, would have yeah. been so in love with this thing. I mentioned how Musgrave Ritual was, you know, partly inspired by Poe's The Gold Bug yeah. on the last episode. Oh, Poe yeah. also had a series in his life that he wrote for um, uh, Graham's Magazine and I think others uh, called Autography, in which he took um, autographs of usually famous people and then he would delineate their kind of psychological character and show how this you know person you could read this in their in their signature um it's so interesting because graphology like got super popular like i feel like around the same time that like astrology um was having a, a resurgence um fad and a lot of it's been debunked in terms of like can you tell things about people's personalities yeah. based on yeah. like the way they draw their letters. Um, although if you see Conan Doyle's, um, any of the facsimiles, I mean, his handwriting is so neat. It's ridiculous. Um, but at the same time, like the, the theory about being able to tell about somebody's physical health based on their handwriting, I think there, mm -hmm. there probably still is um, some truth to that. Um, in my discipline, there is um, a very famous scribe um, I want to say from like Northumbria, um, medieval scribe, and we only know him as the tremulous hand of Worcester. Um, <laughs> uh, his, uh, and there's been all shaky, kinds of articles. Huh? Yeah, there've been all kinds of articles about like what kind, like is this a palsy? Is this like a you know was he drunk? Was he not? Like what was was this a degenerative condition? And it, and it's amazing, but it's there's some of this that um, one thing you can do, which Holmes is on to, and and is that you can identify people that your handwriting oh, yeah. is extraordinarily distinctive, Fair and enough. if you get enough samples of it you can really identify someone by their handwriting um, that it becomes the kind of, you know, it's kind of fingerprint like in a sense. Um, and Holmes though, even with 560 words of this story, he leaves out 23 other deductions uh, of course that, you know, yeah. And Holmes would have been happier if, if Watson had written the story, I'm sure like if he, later he commented, I'd be like, you know, why didn't you include the 23 other deductions in the end of your story? Um, but that's, I mean, that's like want to our house down. Where's the monograph? We need the monograph on this. Yeah. That's not one of his monographs that that we know of. So it's true. But there must have been. Um, all right, that's it with the handwriting. And then it is. Um, he tells about the wound. He examines the the wound on Kerwin. There was no powder blackening on the clothes. This right. is a very you know early ballistics. Yeah. A criminal, you know, forensics going on here that, oh, there's no powder blackening, so it couldn't have been shot there. And then, mm -hmm. obviously, because of the ditch, there was no boot, boot marks around it, and, you know, they would have left some. And so he knows, right, like, Cunningham just lied. None of what yeah. Cunningham said happened. So now, knowing with the lawsuit between Acton and the Cunninghams, um, this is where C Acton breaks in, and he talks about, you know, well, if they had gotten you know, the, 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 a single paper about this, my case would have fallen apart. Crazy. And this is where Holmes confirms. He says, they tried to divert suspicion by making it appear to be an ordinary burglary to which end they carried off whatever they could lay their hands on all this. Mm -hmm. This is all, that is all clear enough, but there was much that was still obscure. And then now he has to find, he knows that Alec took the paper out of the dead man's hand, but right. he needs to find out where it is. And this, Led reasons his... it's got to be in the dressing gown yeah probably still there where, yeah and this is where he explains why he fainted um yeah yeah the inspector was about to say well the only clue we have is the piece of paper and so he had to like dramatically throw himself into a fit um and the colonel being like do you mean to say all our sympathy was wasted on you like um and watson says then what yeah, speaking professionally, it was admirably done, cried I, in <laughs> amazement at this man who was forever confounding me with some new phase of his astuteness. Just the the, the glowing admiration. Yes. Holmes so responds, it is an art which I which is often useful. So, <laughs> so you know, insufferable. I love a him great so much. actor. He's, He's a great actor, and you know. <laughs> And he yeah, fooled the doctor that, into thinking yeah. it was in keeping with the with his previous symptoms. Although I do love he explains it, and Watson's just like, "Oh, what an ass I've been." Yeah. <laughs> um, um, 
then it's um uh again i, I could see another their, their closeness here right i could see that you were commiserating with me over my weakness he's laughing as he says it but, yeah, you know, but sorry to cause you the sympathetic pain which i know that you felt so now he tells them this is why he knocked the table over so we could get to the paper but that's easy enough yeah. for us to figure out as well but he says his son cunningham afterwards as to the motive of the crime was tractable enough but his son was a perfect demon ready to blow out his own or anybody else's brains if he had got to his revolver this is later the home saying about their interview but old cunningham has a made a clean breast of everything um that williams had secretly followed him the cunninghams and saw that they had broken into actons so then it was a blackmail thing that's yeah i mean good for william that he was gonna (laughs) use this for his own he was gonna blackmail his masters so uh the squire and now's where we get the other letter Mm -hmm. and um in the strand then they put the two clues together and we get the clue formed now and let me share the image of this and i'm going to share it along with the image from harper's because again harper's has to redraw it mm. so it's so the handwriting's slightly different that you can see oh, yeah. but harper's also doesn't add the rest of it and i think because they haven't already done this division here and shown yeah. it as an actual torn piece of paper so which is a you know i think doesn't work as well it'd be nicer to see the whole thing together that you just get to see this part of it now um and is and then we get the whole message if you will only come round at quarter to 12 to the east gate you will learn what will very much surprise you and maybe be of the greatest service to you and also to annie morrison but say nothing to anyone upon the matter Oh, Annie Morrison. We like, never get to know about Annie Morrison. There's another thing about this case here that Holmes, for all of his giving us, finding out every tiny detail by the end, we don't, he First just says, of course, we do not know what the relations may have been between Alec Cunningham, William Kerwin, and Annie Morrison. <laughs> what? I That's really need to know. End. What is yeah. that loose end? Uh, <laughs> That's surprising for a story like this. That's surprising for a Sherlock Holmes story. It's surprising for Doyle to um, to have a loose end. Now, yeah. of course, Holmes thinks that, you know, it's it's over. We caught the bad guys. So um, uh, it's over and done with. And he never right. wants to have other people suffer in a sense. So that makes sense in a way. Like, what if we find out that, you know, she could be hurt by this so he's kind of but may, or maybe he just knows that the inspector knows who she is or so. he assumes it's like some sort of like romantic entanglement drama that like really is not really not interesting to him i think she's gone off to meet rachel Howes at the end of musgrave ritual Rachel. <laughs> God, I hope so. there's a place where they're you know where they're together i got a lot to talk about <laughs> Annie Morrison. Wild. It's so wild. Yeah, just introduce a whole new like surname. Like there's nothing to attach her to anybody else. And part of it too, I think, is nice for the reader too. Like there's some other, there's some more here for us to contemplate, mm-hmm. for us to, you know, think about. Um, uh, but it's only for us because Holmes yeah. is, you know, that's it. I he's feel like Doyle's like writing and like reads, he's like, oh, and then, and then he like reaches his word count and he's like, you know what? I don't care. Done. <laughs> Whatever. Any Morrison, but uh, I don't give a shit. I'm. I've. I've reached my word count. I'm. I'm done. I'm good. Well, he does. Holmes does take the time now. Like, let me talk more about handwriting. I yeah, know. Cases no, of please. hereditary shown in the P's and the tail end of the G's. Like, I can't give. This, I can't stop talking about this. <laughs> Won't shut up about the handwriting. Watson's like, but what about Annie Morrison? Probably. Um, and just Holmes is not interested. Annie Morrison. Look at the initial. Look at the tails of the G's. Can you imagine them just like in the carriage ride, like back to the train station, and Holmes is just going on and on and on about the handwriting. They're on the absence. train back to London. Absence of the eye dots and the old man's writing. <laughs> Watson, don't you see? Watson just sitting there on the train, like I'm so glad you're feeling better, but I really wish you would shut up. Well, we get a great final line here. Read the final line. Watson, I think our 
quiet rest in the country has been a distinct success, and I shall certainly return much invigorated to Baker Street tomorrow. And then at, if this was a 70s TV show, <laughs> that line, and you and I would go like, Watson and Holmes would go like, <laughs> and it would be a froze, freeze frame of us laughing, riding back to Baker Street. Perfect. So, Perfect. This is absolutely a, a TV episode from 70s, 80s Our crime story. TV. So. Yeah. yeah. It's like a murder she wrote meets, meets Matlock, meets Columbo, meets insert your favorite buddy cop show. <laughs> It really works, uh, I and, really like it. and I, I. The more I think about, it, the more I like that he that he doesn't give us Annie Morrison at the end to give us to think about to imagine something going on here, yeah. um, and and also that the more I think about, it, the more I think that that's what Holmes does. Yes, he likes to tie things up, but mm -hmm. he doesn't like he doesn't necessarily like people punished if they don't have to be punished. Yeah, and um, uh, and clearly Annie Morrison didn't murder Kerwin, so you know. There you go. No sense in dragging her and her name into this or through the papers. Well, Sherlockians, thank you for joining us for episode 23. 23, right? Of Sherlock Mondays. <laughs> Mary, thank you for oh, coming pleasure. back for this one. You'll return in April for. Yes. I'll return for the return. Episode 29, The Empty House, um, right? Because we're 30 episodes and you're yeah. the next, you know, so you, and you'll be in the, the uh, penultimate. So penultimate episode. Um, our next show, episode 24, Anastasia Klimchinskaya will return for another look at the lasting impact of the British Empire complete with the story of an adventure in India by the crooked man. So I love these stories that, you know, where things that have happened over in the, one of the colonies, Australia, India, one of these places comes back to have some oh yeah, really criminal effect on what's going on here. I did an academic paper on this, the contaminating colonies, how, you know, you can come back home, but you're going to bring India with you. And there's a real threat that you could set that loose. Yeah. Well, that'll friend. be the crooked men, but we also get with crooked man, but we also get Teddy. Teddy. And the hot Teddy. Yeah. <laughs> Which I had a lot of fun with. I was like, what am I gonna do for a cocktail that's not gonna give something away with the plot? And then I was like, oh, I have something for this. There you go. Well. Thank you also to our chat, Mrs. Hudson, Brianna, for managing the live chat links. Thank you to the sponsor of Sherlock Mondays, Lisa Washington. We couldn't do these shows without the generous support of our patrons. You can support the Rosenbach through donation. Your support helps us create more programs like this and also to care for our collections. You can also become a member of the Rosenbach. Membership gives you early access and discounts to programs and courses. You can find out more at our website, rosenback.org. Again, let me remind you to subscribe to our channel, to like these videos. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave us a review. Thank you, Mary. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ed. Everyone, I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenback Museum and Library, where the game is a book. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>